Hey everyone, Mike Brosart here going live with you guys for Wise Wealth Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific, every single Wednesday. I do my very, very best to go live with you guys once a week for this live show. For an hour, I'm going to talk to you guys about anything to do with money, wealth, um, anything to do with anything you want to talk about, money management, building businesses, taxes, all of it, the whole thing. Um, as you guys join in, please let me know if you can hear me. I've got a mic hooked up to my phone, so I'm hoping that it's going through. Uh, I'm hoping that when people join in, they can actually hear what I'm saying, they can actually see me. Uh, I apologize if my internet's a bit laggy. I don't have a second phone as well today. Hey, Jonas, how you doing? Stan, how you doing? Um, so you, it seems like it's live and everyone can hear it. Everything looks like we're getting people jumping on. Um, John, good to hear that you, you got the notification, sweet. Uh, we have four people and four likes already in the first under a minute, which is really awesome, guys. Thank you for joining. I apologize for last week. Um, I had an emergency come up and I couldn't do the Wise Wealth Wednesdays last week. Uh, today I am on. Every week I'll do my very best. Unless an emergency crops up, I will be here for Wise Wealth Wednesdays for you guys. Um, in the comments, just let me know what the questions are. I have someone here with me who's going to read to me the questions as they kind of come up if I don't see them on my phone here. Um, you guys want to talk? I've seen a little blip come up about credit score. So what specifically did you want to hear about credit score? Um, you know, credit score, do you want to know how to build your credit score more effectively? Is there something specifically you're worried about? Um, the general advice is keep your, your uh, utilization around 30%. So if you have $1,000 credit available, use 300 and less uh, on a daily, monthly basis. So that's the key thing at the end of the day. Any other questions, Kyle, coming up? I'm not seeing any just yet. Okay, so if anyone has any questions, shoot them at the bottom. I'll just talk to you guys about whatever you wanna talk about. You wanna hear what, what my week's been up to? I'll give you a live update. Today was a busy day. I have been investigating, buying um, some businesses, actually, and I was doing some due diligence this past week, and I've been in offices um, going through financial statements, editing, you know, bank, going through bank statements and editing cash flow statements, creating income statements, and trying to produce and derive what is the value of this company? And so I'm looking at, say, a two-year payback period. In the next two years, what is the income going to be? How do I forecast what income will be? And so that was what I've been doing. That's what I've been doing the last couple of days. And we've been putting an offer together on that. Um, so that's been really, really exciting. And I'm also looking at a lot of properties. You guys know I, I started a actually a property management company and uh, with a good friend of mine. So we were starting a property management company and we are basically investing with starting with friends, but people want to buy rental properties in London, Ontario, and they're coming to us and they're saying, we want to be passive partners, but we want to buy properties here. And so people have been poking me uh, about doing that for a while now. And I've just been like, you know, I'm too busy to, to manage more properties, but you know what, I'm just going to do it. I'm, I'm going to adhere to that goal the same way I've adhered to this goal of creating content for you guys on a weekly basis for YouTube. Uh, so that's at the end of the day, what I'm here to do is to share with you guys what it's really like for a real guy in London, Ontario, Canada, who's 25 and just, just trying to make it in the world. And uh, I'm a hungry guy, so I'm always trying to bite off more than I can chew and take on more businesses. And so if you guys want to hear about that, let me know. Have any questions come in at all? Yeah, yeah, we got three now. Shoot me a question. What do we got? So the first one comes from Awesome, and he says... Awesome, uh, good to see you again. Uh, what's, your, what's the most you're willing to pay for a house? Uh, above a week is not a good deal no more. I live in the Bay Area, so it's very expensive. Yeah, so the Bay Area, um, California in general, I think is very, very expensive. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when you're looking to justify the price of a house, the question you have to ask yourself is what is the rate of return you're looking to get out of the investment that you're investing in? And so if, for, for me in my market, I like to look for an eight to, to 10 cap rate. Um, so what that means is effectively, there's a certain rate of return that I'm looking for. So if a, the 1% rule is the quick rule of thumb that I like to use and I'm looking at a listing. So let's say a property is selling for $500,000. It needs to be able to rent for 5,000 a month to be worth buying in, in my opinion. So in my market, you can do that. You can still buy for under market. You can renovate it and, and create some value that way. But that's what I really like to look for is at the end of the day, doesn't meet the 1% rule or close to it. If they're, you know, if the tenant's paying all the utilities and all of those pieces, um, that helps a lot too, at the end of the day. Okay, so at the end of the day, it's, uh, that's the key, the key piece there, right? Is, is making sure you're buying undervalued assets and you're having some sort of competitive edge in whatever you're buying. That's, that's the key piece at the end of the day. Uh, no matter what you do, 
it's going to be it's going to be very important that you do that with a competitive advantage. So if you're investing in stocks, make sure you're doing that with a competitive edge or competitive advantage. Um, any other questions there? That I, yep. Okay, you got more. Uh, so the next one comes from John Mage or Wage. Sorry, my apologies. Uh, which index funds would you recommend, or alternatively, which criteria would you recommend when looking for index funds to invest in? Okay, so um, you know, with, with index funds, I think a diversified approach is the the key piece, right? That's why you buy an index fund at the end of the day because you're buying a small piece of many different companies. So, the thing I like about index funds is they're low low fee, right? Um, especially ETFs do a really good job of basically mirroring. Uh, the index type funds. So I'm a big proponent, a big fan of, uh, a, a really big fan of buying uh, ETFs with low management expense ratios, low MERs. And so low MER is so, so, so important. Um, a lot of them you're seeing now, there are ETF products and, and that that act a lot like mutual funds. So there are, they are actually actively managed. They're calling them ETFs, but they're not really computer passively managed funds and they have high MERs. When I say high, like a percent and a half. Um, and so you're, you're overpaying for the management and they don't really outperform. Uh, MER is management expense ratio. So that's, that's a, effectively MER is if your fund performs at say 5%, they are taking 2% of that as a fee to the fund, a management expense ratio. Um, if your fund performs at, at negative 2%, they still take 2%, so you're at negative 4%. Uh, that, that comes off no matter what, every single year, on all assets under management, and that's something that you can really look to save a bit of money on. Because if you think about it, you know, if you have a two and a half percent MER, which is the average mutual fund in Canada that the you know the big banks are selling, and you know all of those guys like Sun Life and London Life and all those David Van, they're all selling those high fee MER products. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, if you compound that over a twenty-five or thirty-year time horizon at two and a half percent, what you'll find is that it it just destroys. Um, it just destroys a lot of your equity gains that you could have had. So instead of having, you know, say, you know, a million dollars grows into two million, it would have grown into three or four million had you not had those compounding MERs at two and a half percent every single year. So on a million dollars, that's twenty five thousand in fees every single year, and they are growing and compounding on each other because you could have been growing with that money. So the opportunity cost of that growth is very very expensive at the end of the day. Um, what other qu any other questions? Maybe I can just see yeah. on the laptop or. Yeah, next, one. next question. Uh, Matt, if someone is trying to save that 50K you've said is a good place to start investing, would yeah. you recommend they build up to that in ETFs or say a high interest savings account? Yeah, um, yes. I, I think that depends on your time horizon, right? If you're going to buy a house in a year and you, you're investing in, in indexes or ETFs, your time horizon is so short that you could potentially lose money going to a down market. So if something happened in the market, and we saw 2008 style um, returns, right? So you have maybe negative 20%. You need to wait two or three years, like that index, if you're diversified, that ETF portfolio that you have, that index portfolio will recover. The data shows it will recover no matter what in a certain amount of time, like two, three, four years. But you know, at the end of the day, if, if you have to sell to buy this property in 2010, I did this once, I sold some, some shares under market value and I did it because I wanted to buy a property and the property is a really good deal, so it was worth it for me. But you know, at the end of the day, you, I had to, to swallow those losses on my portfolio because I wasn't in, for instance, a high interest savings account. If your time horizon is a year, you know, it might make more sense to be in something that's, that's guaranteed, right? There are a lot of high interest savings accounts that pay, you know, two and a half, two point seven percent, which is higher than inflation. So you're getting something. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, at least you know that when you have that deal fall into your lap, you can act quickly. You can jump on that deal and there's value there being able to buy that property or, you know, even if, if you think, you know, something's going to happen like a business opportunity, right? Having that capital readily available is super, super valuable and something I recommend. So the, the index fund ETF strategy is when you have a longer time horizon. So for a retirement portfolio, um, you know, if you're planning something like three to five years from now, that would make a lot of sense. Mr. BV, hey, how you doing? I just saw you pop up on the phone. Welcome to the live stream. You are joined by five other people. We have five people on, on live stream, which is totally cool. Uh, keep throwing the questions out there. Um, any other topics or questions I should hit? Well, Jonas said uh, the goal for him is to save 50K in one to two years. Nice. So, so wow, that's, that's aggressive. His, so that's his time. I'm going to hold you to that. That, that this is publicly live. This has just been said live. So we're going to hold you to that. Save that, that amount of money up so you have the capital to then buy your first property. And John Wage again says some context. My goal is to eventually live off of the interest of his index funds. 
Yes. So there's a, that's a really important key piece. Never spend the principal. No matter what you're doing, I'm a huge advocate of, you know, every time you earn a dollar, put like 50 cents away and that 50 cents, you can never spend it. It's not even yours. It's gone. It's in like the future, future you fund and you only spend the growth on that money. In fact, like if you're still, if you're in a high growth phase, you might even reinvest all of the growth back into the fund and let the principal grow. But let's say my principal grows to like 250,000. Don't touch that 250,000. Leave that aside. If you need extra income, you find, you know, an employer or you find, you know, you have some active income. You do something like that um, rather than drop from your fund, which is another reason to have emergency funds. So you don't ever have to sell off pieces of, of equity in a property or or active stocks or bonds. So, but yeah, great idea because you want to build a portfolio that's going to create passive income. At the end of the day, that's how you unlock financial freedom. Okay. Great so question. Jonas again asks: Are wholesalers or wholesalers wholesalers? We'll go with wholesalers. Okay. A way to find good deals, um, and what are some ways to find some great deals? Yeah, wholesalers can be great ways to find a deal. Um, they can also be, they can also provide you average deals. So you have to be careful. Um, you have to be very, very careful. Some wholesale deals I've, deals I've seen come across are, are near market value. And they, you know, after their wholesale fee, it's been, you know, thrown on there, especially in the hot market. Um, sometimes the wholesale deal isn't as attractive as you might think. That said, you know, I just locked up a deal very recently. Um, it was a great wholesale deal and, and I'll probably do very, very well on it. Um, would you pay more than I missed that. Would you pay more than... Would you pay more than work for a house or no? Oh, sorry. Hmm. Oh, yeah. So... Yeah, uh, would you pay more than 200 k for a house? Or okay. No? Um, it, it just depends on the, on the rent income coming in. It's all it's all relative. So, you know, a $200,000 house that's renting, that can only rent for $1,000 a month? No. Um, a $200,000 house that can rent for $2,000 a month? Yeah, maybe. Depending on the condition and some, several factors on, on the house there. Um, what are thoughts on rising interest rates? Do they influence income properties? Yes. I think that rising interest rates, we're in an environment right now, the, the US Fed just today increased um, their lending rate a quarter percent. So we're actually in a trade war with the United States. Um, not really a full on trade war, but it's, it seems like it's bubbling up to that point where we're throwing tariffs on each other. And it's not really good for either economy actually long term. It's gonna have negative consequences for the United States economy because they rely on a lot of our natural resources like our energy, our water, you know, trees, mining, all these things, they, they rely on lumber. It, this trade war um, is actually not good for either country and we have to follow suit to, to stabilize our currency. So the Canadian currency has been dropping uh, as a result of a lot of this. So we're gonna need to, I think, follow suit, uh, raising interest rates another quarter to follow the US. Uh, so I think interest rates will rise a quarter percent at the least. Probably we'll see three more hikes, I think, in the next year, year and a half. So I'm a big proponent of, if you can lock in cheap debt now, there's value there. Like, don't get me wrong. If you can lock in, like I have some mortgages locked in at 2%, 2.5%. That's huge when mortgages are now at 3, 3.5%. So I've got really cheap debt. And cheap debt builds a lot of wealth um, really quickly, right? So that, that's really important at the end of the day. That'll help you ensure that your portfolio is sol solid. But back to the interest rate rising and that relationship to housing prices. So typically what we see, you know, there's, there's a dozen conflating factors that determine property value, right? And, and each segment of the market is slightly different and affected in different ways. But on average, about a 1% increase in interest rates translates to about a 5% drop in property values. So what we should see is, theoretically, as interest rates rise, you should see property values um, kind, of, kind of dropping down, right? Assuming that, that supply and demand economics do not, and other, many other factors do not come into play to push against this force, right? Specifically in my market here, we're seeing interest rates rise a percent, and yet the market is still roaring as hot as it's ever been, partially because people are locking in cheap debt while they can, and that's incentivizing them to then go and, and buy some properties while they still can. Um, wow, well, we have 13 people on, which is, is awesome, or people are watching and they're engaged. So you're obviously enjoying this. I'm hoping this is adding value, so keep, keep the questions coming. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it, it comes down to, you, you can't predict the future. We don't have a crystal ball. I have no idea where real estate prices will go. You know, immigration is a big factor. If we're bringing in a lot of new immigrants, um, that'll increase rental demand, which should drive, um, you know, rental income up, right? Because rent prices are rising. So rental properties would then, there'd be higher demand for rental properties. So we should then see, uh, you know, we, we should see this sort of uh, increase in, in demand for that would then drive housing prices uh, up because you have more net income and people pay 
based on or for rental properties based on cap rate, based on the amount of return they're able to to get from the, the rental properties. So at the end of the day, uh, they're also factoring in interest rates. So if you're if you got a property that can return eight percent, right? You've got a you know a lot of properties, especially in like New York, Toronto, Vancouver, California, in all of those areas, you know a lot of them are trading at like a five cap rate, right? If you had interest rates at six percent. Rental properties make nothing. You're losing money every month. And at, at that point, the demand for rental for, for income properties, it drops, right? The same problem in the 80s and 90s when they gave apartment buildings away for a dollar, right? Because they couldn't even produce enough income to cover the interest cost on the property. So no one wants to own investment properties in that type of market. So it is very conceivable and very plausible that the doomsday sayers, you know, I wouldn't say the total collapse is coming, right? I don't think that's true. But I think there'll be a point where we, you know, business cycles are such that we end up back to where we were in the 80s and like late 80s where it was roaring and then it kind of, we had a lull and especially in Canada um, where there's not a demand for rental properties. And we were seeing a 6% drop in the year. And as soon as we see a year where prices are down, could you imagine if in LA prices drop 5% year over year, there would be no demand. No one wants to hold real estate when it's dropping. No one wants to hold any asset class when it's dropping. And humans are irrational. So we're thinking to ourselves, you know, this is just not something that, that I want to do and I'm not making any cash flow, at least if you're buying in a market where there's cash flow. Like if you're buying a property where there's a thousand dollars a month cash flow, like I'm getting in my market right now, if property values drop 20%, I don't care um, because I have cash flow coming at a thousand dollars a month. If rents even drop, bring some rent controls, whatever, I still have a thousand dollars margin. So be very, very careful. I think in certain markets, specifically in LA, I think, you know, New York, Toronto, Vancouver, I'm actually very bearish on those markets because appreciation will not last forever. We will, you know, in Toronto, for instance, just got a phone call. This is what happens. This is, this is what happens live. Tenants just called me. Um, this is literally what's happening in my life. I have a tenant just called me. I'll deal with that call later. It's, it snapped the live stream off. Um, this is the life of real estate investor. You'll have your phone ringing. I'm sure I'll have a dozen texts from contractors and, and tenants and things. I don't mind that stuff. You know, at the end of the day, I can take a call couple calls a day for, for a few hundred bucks. But you know, you, you got to really consider the risk at the end of the day. And then is the risk proportionate to the reward? This gravy train we've had for the last eight years in, in all of our equities, since 2009, we've had one of the greatest bull markets of all time. Equities have grown um, faster than they ever have. And you know, it's fantastic at the end of the day that, that we've been able to build this amount of wealth, right? And real estate has followed suit. We've had a huge amount of upswing and upgrowth and, and lift to the price of housing that could come to an end, right? That we could foreseeably have three, four, five years where it's flat. And in those markets, you're making nothing on appreciation. So you better make damn sure you're able to at least cover your mortgage payments. I'd like to even see a bit of additional margin in there for things like, you know, um, vacancy, CapEx, your, your roof goes, your furnace goes. I wanna, I wanna see you bake in the vacancy. I wanna see you bake in a month, a year that's vacant or, you know, bake in, et cetera. Even if you're like in my market right now, it's like a 2% vacancy rate. So it's almost impossible not to rent a place out right now. But, you know, I like to make sure that just I have that extra layer of comfort and protection. No matter what happens, it's, it's better to be able to, to have that ability um, to, to float in times of recession here. So I see some, some questions here. Do you think the GTA is worthwhile place to be buying a home? I'm starting off with a ton of money and find the prices around Toronto intimidating. Um, you know, honestly, you can make money in Toronto. There, I know a lot of people that do do well in Toronto. I'm not a huge fan of Toronto. I think that, um, y you know, I think prices are, are really high right now and the, the numbers just aren't making sense. People are buying, someone was telling me about a sweet deal that they had the, a little bit ago. And they're like, I bought a condo in Toronto and I bought it for like 600,000 and it's renting for like 3,000 a month or like 2,700 a month. And they're like, I'm only putting in a thousand a month to carry the costs. I'm like, what? Like you're, you're funding your own rental property out of your own pocket? He's like, yeah, I'm only putting in $1,000 a month. Like, isn't that fantastic? And I own a condo. And I'm like, what? Like you're losing money every month. You have no, not only do you have no cash flow, you're actually losing money. He's like, oh, but you know, mortgage pay down. And I'm like, yeah, but you're negative $1,000 every single month. Could you imagine if you had a vacancy, how much worse that would be? Or if you had a tenant destroy a unit, how much worse that's going to be for you to then throw out all those repair costs as well. So. Um, I'm not extremely bullish on Toronto. I'm very bearish on Toronto. I know you can buy properties in Toronto that break even or you know have a little bit of cash flow in your pocket every month. You're relying heavily on appreciation. And so you're, unless you're buying under market value, like if you can find a deal in Toronto right now, you can knock on some doors as someone says, 
I will sell you my house. I bought it in 1998 and I just want to make 200 grand. Like I will sell it to you for a million. And you know, you can like do small cosmetic renovation or some way you can change the angle of the property. You can duplex it or there's something you can do to add value to the property. And then let's say it's worth 1.4, 1.5, do it. Like I'm not going to not encourage that because that's something that you should be doing. If that's your skill set and you have that, that, you know, network and connection, go and go ahead and hit that deal hard. There are flippers and there are, there are investors and rental investors in Toronto. They're doing really, really well, but buying on the M open MLS open uh, multi-listing service, realtor.ca here in, in, in Ontario and Canada, you're going on there and you're buying with an agent, a publicly listed uh, property. It's a hundred eyeballs have seen it before you even put your offer on it. Right. And when you put your offer on it, you're competing with everyone else. And so it's very, very hard to get a good deal under market value. You're typically paying at market value or in this market, you know, even slightly above market value potentially. So that's why I'm extremely bearish on that type of environment because you don't have any cash flow. You're relying solely on appreciation, which we can't bet on. You're basically gambling. Um, you know, real estate is typically moved at around inflation. So if you're just banking on appreciation, um, you know, I think there's probably better equities you can invest your money in. The one argument would be that with real estate, you can get a ton of leverage. So if you have access to cheap debt, if you can borrow like two and a half percent, a million dollars, I mean, you're gonna do all right, I think, no matter what. Um, so I'm not gonna, there are certain situations where it makes sense. And the answer is sort of, it depends um, on that one there. So I'll read the next one here. Go to your couple of these, a couple. Yeah, shoot me one. Uh, Phil Williamson says, do you prefer hey, Phil. rentals? versus regular market rentals. Uh, what has your experience been with rate of return and amount of work for you? Yes, so I I have all types of uh, residential real estate. So I've done the single family, I do the single family. I've done the duplex, triplex, rooming house situation, like 22 bedroom thing. And I've done the student rental thing where I've got five or six bedrooms in a property. And you know, there's levels of work and levels of profitability. So on a, on a student rental, I expect greater turnover. So I have to spend more time re-renting the units out every year or two years, patching students in and out. Um, I'll try to sign them as one group, but still the group only lasts a year or two and then you gotta change it over again. So there's more turnover. Turnover requires more painting, more cleaning, uh, you know, showings, signing the lease. There's a lot of work associated with that. As a result, I expect one and a quarter percent rule on a, on a fan, uh, Fanshawe or Western student rental. So if I'm paying $200,000 for, or $300,000 for a student rental, you know, I expect around $3,500 a month in rent. That's a sort of a general rule that I look for. I have that extra four or $500 a month there for those extra utilities, those extra damages, you know, just that extra stress. So I'm getting paid better because the property requires more effort. So there's a higher return, but also higher effort. So that's, that's where the student game is. In the beginning, I was more comfortable with that because my first house hack, I was used to renting to students myself. And uh, I, it was just something I was comfortable with. I was a student myself, just graduated. And so for me, it made a lot of sense, really at the end of the day, to, to buy into student rentals. But then I expanded and got into duplexes and triplexes and I converted single families into duplexes and things like that. And that allows you a greater return. So if you can, for instance, have two units in a property, you're better, better utilizing the space sometimes. And often those tenants stay longer term. And so you end up getting you know, less headaches and less calls and less turnover, slightly less return, but you know, less headaches and turnover and, and that sort of thing. And I find that the student market is very um, seasonal, we'll call it, because you got to rent to them around like the end of April or the start of September, and that's it. If you miss that, if you miss that boat, your property's vacant until the next window, because no one's looking for a property in like December, like no October, right? Middle of October, no one's looking for a property. Everyone's already found their place. They're in school full time. So the student properties, you may experience a lot of vacancy if you're not good at marketing your property or you buy it, if you buy and close on a property in July, renovate it, miss the September 1st bandwagon or the August showing band, uh, bandwagon of time, right? To get on that bandwagon, then you're, you're stuck in a different uh, vacancy period until you can get on and sort of, uh, you know, catch back up on the student cycle. So that's my thought on student rentals versus um, single families and duplexes and, and triplexes. Rooming houses, again, you can crank out a ton of cash flow out of those as well. They are a pain. You'll get a lot of calls. The headache level is even higher than students. They're even more high maintenance and they fight between each other. And we'll, I'll save that for another video on like bad tenants and some of my experiences there. <laughs> what, what else do we got for, for questions there? Uh, so this one actually kind of relates to that previous one. I'm okay. uh, just wondering, excluding mortgage, on student rentals, if you add all expenses like hydro, gas, taxes, etc., yeah. what are you averaging for expenses on your student rentals in London? Okay, so in, in my market here, um, 
usually if I'm bringing in about $3,000 a month on a property, if I've made it lean, I've, I've put in good insulation, for instance, I've got you know decent windows and all that, so my utilities are, are fairly low, and I've got a good group in there. I'm talking you know, some conservative, not, not too conservative, but not overly liberal, like they're not throwing ragers and parties, they're not going crazy on the utilities. Um, I like to see, with mortgage pay down, about 1600 bucks a month in profit. So my cash flow might be a little over a thousand uh, a month on a property that's in the 250, 275 purchase price range. So that's kind of where, you're, so you can work backwards from that. If I'm bringing in about 3000 a month, I'm looking to bring in about 1500 in expenses or so, including my mortgage. So that kind of gives you a, a flavor. I'd say compared to family rentals, you'll see like 10, 20% higher expenses. Um, do you or are you thinking about investing in the U.S.? Um, no, uh, I have no interest in filing a U.S. tax return and all of the complications related to that. So for that sole reason, I probably won't invest in U.S. real estate. That said, I would invest in U.S. equities. Um, and I do invest in U.S. equities specifically through exchange traded funds. So I'm a big fan of, of that specifically, but not a big fan of, um, you know, U.S. real estate only because I don't have... I don't have the trades. Like right now, if I have a problem in a property, I know like two electricians, plumbers, contractors, handymen. I just know a lot of people in speed dial that I can call. I have those connections. I know exactly what market rents are. I know exactly, you know, I just, I just know all of these things at the end of the day. Hey Jared, just saw you, you pop in there. Um, something about vegan. I, I missed that question. I've got about... a couple of them backlogged here. What is that about? It, it would so, be vegan. Lava Cake earlier asked, is it vegan to eat the Mona Lisa? And then Chris G <laughs> asked, would it be vegan if the Mona Lisa ate you? So we'll go with the double whammy. I would say cannibalism is, assuming that was like you're talking about the real person or the painting. I guess the painting would just be paper. And so that would be sort of, that would, that would be vegan, I guess, because you'd be vegan. eating paper. It's Unless it's like vegan. oil paints. I don't know if that produced from like animal remains that have the like, oil and the paint would be produced from animal think, remains. I don't, I don't, well, so yeah, yeah. then you'd be technically eating deceased. That's a bit of like, a jump. Yeah. Yeah. I, like the fossil, it. like yeah. fossilization of the oil. I don't know. So yeah, I, I guess depending how you made the paint, eating that would be vegan. I'm not vegan. I'm a plexitarian. So plexitarian is the idea that I try to eat more uh, vegetables and fruits than I do meat, but I still enjoy a good burger and a good steak on occasion. I just don't overindulge. In, in meat. My wife tries to be vegetarian vegan, so I try to support her as much as I possibly can on that front, but I am not a vegan. No. F funny note on that part, I saw that on Reddit the other day, someone had spotted a girl who looked exactly like the Mona Lisa. It was this girl, this actual wow. person who looked like the Mona Lisa. So if they're asking in regards to that, then, then you're getting into cannibalism. That's definitely not veganism. So yeah, that's true. Yeah, I don't recommend that. I'm not promoting that at all. No, no. Oh, just a question. When you're building your net worth in your earlier years, were you trying to keep your costs down? How did you deal with costs of friendship? Ah, John, it's a great question. Um, it is a very true uh, point that when you're building your, your net worth in the beginning, spending less is so important. Like a lot of people make 100 grand a year and spend 100 grand, so they have nothing. Um, and you're going to have people in your life that want to, you know, they, they want to see you go out with them. They want to see you go out for food or, you know, go out to the movies or, or whatever. Right. And so a lot of that is, is going to, you know, just pick your friends. At the end of the day, if you have spendy friends, it's really hard to be in that frugal mindset. So finding the right people to associate with that'll help you like up your game and, and stay on your path and stay on your goal. If it is truly your goal to, to spend less and earn more and then build that, that net worth, right. Build that gap between the two. You've got to make that a priority. And so you kind of have to make a choice that said, like, you don't have to, take those friends out of your life, you might just say, hey guys, I, I'm not going to come out tonight. Or if I'm going to go out, I'm going to pull, you know, just, just a water. I'm going to get a water when I go out. Or, you know, maybe I'll just get a, a light appetizer. I already ate guys. Like, I'll just join you guys for a meal or, you know, that kind of stuff. Or, you know, hey, you want to split with me? I'm not that hungry. And someone at the table might be like, oh, I already ate too. I'm not that hungry. Let's split something, right? And so you're able to kind of economize and, and basically effective dollar utility is the key piece here. And you want to make sure that you're making your dollars go as far as they possibly can. And, and that's just really, really important with, with anything, I think, you know, whether you're investing or you know, buying properties or just managing your personal finances and, and managing your money. You wanna make sure you're stretching those dollars as far as you possibly can. And some of those friends are, are spending, you know, that's, they're making 60 grand and they're spending all of their salary, they're saving nothing at the end of the year. Do you wanna be in the same boat as them? Well, if, if the answer is no, then you have to make different choices than they've made, right? And so that's, that's a tough thing to do. It's, it's really hard 
to go against the stream, right? You're, you're basically tr like moving with the stream and you turn around and now you're going against the stream, right? And your friends are gonna try to, you know, pull you with them. Like, come on, man. And you're like, no, I gotta go this way. So, you know, it, it's tough. It really is. And I had some of those same battles. Um, okay, okay. When do I become rich? <laughs> um, you become rich slowly. You get rich slowly. It, what happens is if you stay on this bandwagon, right? If you guys, if you start building wealth and you're spending like here, and you're making like here, you've got this big gap. And that gap is effectively what you're able to like create as wealth. And as you start opening yourself up to opportunities, like, hey, I've got $20,000 saved, I can invest in this opportunity or that opportunity. And as that starts to grow, it really becomes exponential. So at that point, when you get that launching pad, um, it, it really just, it does just take off. And you will have that point where like, it begins to compound so quickly that, like my point right now, I could go get a day job and like my past, my, my investments, all of my wealth is invested such that my my money minions, right? I have like, let's say you have like 500,000 or a million dollars. You have a million little money minions, each dollar is out there working for you. And it's producing like 10% for you every single year. So then you get to enjoy the fruits of basically your money's labors. It works harder than you did. And that was the point for me last year when I quit my job in management consulting. I'm like, you know, um, it just doesn't make sense anymore. For, for someone to effectively um, work at say make 60 grand a year, if my passive income can bring me like 80 or, or 90,000 a year or even all of my expenses. Um, just saw it twice, something pop up, USDA yeah, loan. He's, he's I don't know a whole lot about the USDA loan. I assume that's like the 3% down, um, 3.5% down. I, I'm Canadian, so um, I don't know a lot about this loan. I think it's similar to like a private mortgage insurance type loan. So effectively, my understanding would be that you're buying a house with less down than the traditional 20%. Typically, like in Canada, it's like 5%. I think in the US, you can get 3 3.5%. Um, it, it, I think it's effectively a, a loan where you pay a, a, a certain fee to the lender, to a private insurance company. Um, yeah, he's got a 0% loan. Like a VA. 0% oh. down. Um, yeah, I, I guess those exist for like veterans or something like that. I have heard of these types of programs. We don't have this in Canada, so far as I know. Um, be sweet if we did, but just, I mean, maybe there's some benefit there. You should take advantage of that. If you have a 0% loan, like go buy some properties. Um, how can you go wrong there? Uh, I mean, seriously, no, I just saw your comment pop up. You're a boss, man. Thanks. Pre-approved for a mortgage, 22 years old. Nice. Yeah. Buy, buy properties. I don't know. Fort Wayne. Nice. Um, if the cap rates are great there, I mean, go ahead and do it. Um, buy some properties, create some cash flow for yourself. Take advantage of that cheap debt because where else can you take your money and buy five to one? You put $100,000 into a rental property and you lever up 20% down, 80% loan to value. You lever up five to one. So $100,000 buys $500,000 in real estate assets. Where can you lever up? You just can't lever up that way uh, typically. Although there is a strategy with REITs, real estate investment um, vehicles, where you can actually buy public equities or private equities. And, you know, how are you doing? Welcome. Um, you know, where, where you join in and you're, you're welcome to the conversation we're talking here about um the idea that you could effectively use leverage to buy a lot more assets than you could uh you know if you were um you know just buying in cash right so if you're buying like a stock you're only able to buy in cash if you're buying there's certain REIT strategies where you can you could lever up you can use margin account buying so you can buy in a margin account um effectively two or three to two to one sometimes, three to one sometimes. You can take 100,000 to buy $200,000 in equities in a brokerage account, like a DIY brokerage account. And you could then buy into a REIT that leverage your money up for you. So you could buy into that REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust, and they would effectively go buy real estate for you. And they'll lever, they'll lever up three to one. So you could lever up two to one and then buy them three to one. So you'd be levering up six to one. You can actually lever up really, really effectively with REITs if you can get cheap debt, but you can borrow your against your own properties even cheaper, right? Like you're talking 0% VA loans. You're talking about, you know, 3%. Um, you know, at the end of the day, that's just so cheap. I mean, there aren't a lot of real estate assets that can't cash flow at least 3% gross, right? So if you're borrowing at 3%, as long as your, your asset, your real estate underlying asset is returning a higher rate than your, your interest rate and also room for expenses, you're doing all right. So if you have to buy an asset that can produce 8% gross, on, on it and then you lever up at a cost of 3% interest. Then you've got that 5% spread for expenses, whatever. And basically you're, you're taking your money and you're earning all of that extra leverage. Um, leverage makes it five to one. So if you're doing a 8% return on a property and buy a 20% loan to value, that 8% becomes 
40% rate of return, ROI, return on investment. So that's really, really important. Leverage makes good deals great. Like buying real estate in cash is not necessarily um, the best use of capital. You could go buy equities and get a similar return and buy REITs and they'll lever your money up for you and passively give you a similar return. Um, so yeah, the fact is that you can get cheap debt. That's just a huge advantage. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, shoot me some questions here, Kyle. So what are, Awesome asked uh, earlier, what hey, awesome. are the best house hacking tips you can give? Okay, house hacking. About, well, hang on, how do yep. you find out how much homes can rent for? Okay, so kind of yeah, so part. homes, um, you just gotta go on and go on Kijiji, go on Craigslist and find out what a bedroom is renting for, find out what a unit is renting for. In a few hours you could uh, deduce exactly what a property can rent for in a certain neighborhood with certain characteristics. So it's not too hard to figure out what something can rent for, but going on Craigslist, going on Kijiji, just looking at some listings and seeing exactly what things are renting for. When you're looking at house hack, you wanna find a property that can effectively generate the most possible cash for you. So I look to rent out, like when I house hack, I'd like to rent out the majority of the spaces that I'm not using. So I don't like basements, I just, I'm not a big fan of them. So I always like to throw in suites, like nanny suites in my, in my basements, because then I can use that space to generate basically my mortgage payment. And if I have like a three or four bedroom, maybe I'll take the second story and the main floor, I'll have a bedroom, I'll rent that bedroom out too. Because you know what, I'm already on the second floor, I don't need another office or whatever, I'll rent that out for a little extra cash flow as well. So that's one way I really like to house hack. Once you have a family, like I have a, a two and a quarter year old daughter and, and my wife, we really can't be sharing bedrooms with people anymore. Like I did that for a long time in my first house hack. Now we have a duplex living scenario where I just rent a separate unit altogether. And we have our own three bedroom bungalow for ourselves, so that's something you can look at. You click semis too, where you can be side by side and rent one side out and live in one side. That's another way to house hack or triplexes, same thing, rent two units out, live in one. Another really awesome way to, to do that. I've seen tons of questions crop, crop up. Yeah, I gotta get to these. I've, I've still got a couple banked here. I see a lot of people here, nice, yeah, nice. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to sort through some of them. Um, Angel. Hey, Angel. Adri, Adri, Adri Shiv? Adri Shiv? I don't, I'm sorry, I'm butchering. Yeah, I'm name. seeing that. Um, how can we avoid crucial mistakes when buying our first property? Yeah, so I'm looking at that question right here. Um, okay, so there are, you can make a lot of mistakes buying your first property. I think one of the biggest mistakes you can make is the analysis paralysis, not buying anything at all, right? And letting good deals pass you by. That's something that I did too before I pulled the trigger and had the, had the, uh, I don't know, the, like the, the balls, the cojones to just go ahead and buy something. But I guess uh, one way to avoid that those big mistakes. One of the biggest mistakes is gonna be buying overpriced. One way you make sure you don't buy overpriced is go look at 100 properties. Like, I'm serious, go look at 100 listings. Maybe even like, maybe then go see like 25 of those properties with more than one agent. Like, don't just stick to one agent unless you know this guy's really good, but interview several agents and look at a lot of properties. You get a feel for the current market, you get a feel for current market value, and you'll find some deal in that process. So buy smart. Like you make most of your money in real estate on the buy side. Almost every deal I've ever closed, I made money on day one. Like I bought the property and it was like, right now I know I can just create 25,000 in value for 5,000 renovation immediately. Or I know I can just like convert the way this property is being used and add an extra two bedrooms and boom, now I can bring in a ton of rent and I know it's just gonna be tons of value. So that's really key at the end of the day. Um, just saw something pop up. Hey Noel, hey Chris. Um, so that's something that's really, really key at the end of the day. And also get a home inspection. I started doing my own, but I'd bring contractors through and look at everything and make sure that, you know, effectively we are uh, maximizing the, the value of our dollar. So if you're buying crappy real estate that's got a bad foundational issue or whatever else, then you're taking a big risk. It's gonna add in the cost of the property and make it a bad buy. So just be smart on the buy side. That's the most important thing you can do is be smart on the buy. If you do well on the buy, you'll be perfectly fine. You'll avoid a lot of the mistakes you can make in real estate. Um, the other thing I see people make a mistake on too is expensive debt. They don't shop around, they get debt at like 4%, 5%. Shop around and find a loan at two or 3% if you can. Find a way to get that interest cost down because that's one of the major expense line items you're gonna have is, you, you know, effectively it's, it's gonna be basically what it's costing you to, to finance the property. So keep that in mind. Uh, I'm gonna try to bang off a couple of these questions here. I have to go at eight and a bit, put my daughter down to bed. Um, Noah, by the way, thanks for commenting. I, I hope that you're able to buy some properties. Keep me up to date on that. A lava cake, man, you're just all over the place. Blowing up Pluto. No, I would not blow up Pluto. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have an opinion either way on Pluto. I hear it's a really, really cold place. I hear it's not even a planet sometimes. It goes back and forth every time I read online. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, Nico, thanks for making it on. Awesome to see you on here. Chris, are nunchuck plants animals or minerals? I don't even know. We, we don't even know that. I don't even know what that's all about. Uh, Amazing, know that you got approved for 120,000 on your first loan. Go ahead and take advantage of that. Um, that cheap and buy a really solid producing uh, income property. I apologize if you guys hear my daughter in the background. She's getting ready for for bed uh, there pretty soon. I've got a couple more here. Uh, okay. There's one. Uh, what are the chances of not finding roommates, tenants, if you are pricing the rent at market value, kind of going along that home ownership? Um, yeah, so, you know, I think in my market, it's very, very easy to find a good tenant. Like, you know, at the end of the day, it's super easy to find a really quality tenant because it's a rent, it's a sort of a landlord's market or a, um, I guess it's, it's hard for tenants to find places right now because there's just a shortage, there's just so much demand. So I have my pick from the litter of tenants every time I've been looking. So I find it pretty easy to find tenants. But at the end of the day, even when I was in, like back in 2012, back in like 2013, I remember renting out some units and it wasn't as hot here in, in London, Ontario. And it was a little bit harder to find the right tenant. So I would just say, wait a little bit longer. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I got was just make sure you have quality properties. Like the quality product will sell itself. Like if you have a really nice property, no matter what, you will be safe. Like people will want to rent a nice quality rental product because there's a lot of crap. There's a lot of shit on the market that just, there's a lot of bad slumlord type properties. So if you just have like an A-level property, it's fairly easy to get A-level rent. In fact, like you might be a little bit above market value because you're ensuring that your quality of your product is that good. At the end of the day, real estate is a business, right? And as a business, the thing you're selling is your property, is the space that you're renting out or selling. And so just have a quality product. Look for the type of finishes that tenants are interested in. Um, often adding like laundry or a dishwasher to a unit. Those simple things add a ton of value. Someone will pay a lot more for a unit, even 50 bucks a month if they have in-suite laundry that's free to use or a dishwasher, right? They'll pay $25 more a month or if they're between two places and your place has a dishwasher and a little bit nicer closet in the bedroom and in-suite laundry, you'll win, right? So little things like that have a big I think, in, in all of this, so. I think we could knock off a couple of these. Yeah, let's quick. bang some off. So, Noel Gardner, how hard was it for you to acquire your first home equity loan? See if we can get that one off. Yeah, so that one's really, it's a long story. Um, oh, crap. <laughs> it was tough. Uh, I got a lot of no's. Like, expect to get like six or seven, like, no's before you get a yes. Um, I was able to, to, I was working at a credit union for the summer. I got a good position. I was able to get a connection there to Bank of Montreal. They took a chance on me. Um, my half of the mortgage, I, I bought it with my girlfriend at the time, now my wife. And my half the mortgage, I able, was able to negotiate for um, my Ivy line of credit that I had for school. I didn't use it for school, I used it to buy the property. And then wife's half, her parents helped with income qualifying for her. So we were able to get the mortgage together and then we refinanced it six months later ourselves again at a better interest rate. So that was something that we did um, to get our first property. After that, it was actually hardest to get the rental properties after that until I got about three or four. And then I started having income and T776s to show my tax return, rental income coming in. Um, that really helped me in showing leases that I have rental in income coming in. It was actually helping me to buy more properties. So it got easier the more income I had from the rental properties. So that was really key. Um, Anybody knock one, on, one more off? Yeah, let's keep going. All right. Uh, hi, Michael. I've been enjoying your YouTube channel and I've learned a lot. Uh, regarding the EFT investing strategy, my question is that we ETF. have approximately, or yeah, sorry. It's Exchange traded funds. That's what ETFs are. Yeah. Uh, we have approximately 50 grand in both Roth IRA and a Roth IRA okay. and stupidly never invested. Uh, should we put it all in at one time or do dollar cost averaging and put it in slowly every month? Thanks a lot. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of up to you. I think that it's hard, it's impossible. Like time in the market over timing the market is the saying I like to use, right? The longer you're in the market, the better you will do. Um, it's about time in the market. So if you're in the market for 10 years versus five, um, you're gonna do a lot better like by waiting five years and then investing you'll be worse off than if you Bought at, in year one even if there was a recession The data shows that time in the market is more important than trying to time the market You could theoretically if you're really worried about a recession. You're like hey, it's right around the corner I'm super afraid. I think things are gonna crash Maybe just put like a half or a quarter in and then put the other half or a quarter in something that's more stable right like you know, I don't know you could there are a lot of companies out there that do loans, for instance, to like manufacturing companies and to buy equipment and secured against assets. So you could put it in something like that that generates 6% or 7% return and it's at least parking your wealth into something before you move it over to like publicly listed companies. You could be in some, you know, debt type vehicle. 
but at least you're getting a return in, in your Roth IRA. At least you're doing something with that money. It's growing and beating inflation. Because if you're doing nothing with your money, it's in cash. It's actually devaluing. Like if you're fifty thousand after one year, like forty eight thousand, and et cetera, et cetera, right? Like forty eight five, and then just drop, 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 depending on the rate of the real rate of inflation. And there's some studies around shadow economics that. I think the government suppresses the real inflation rate. Certain items are actually inflating much faster than the average consumer price index. Let me see if I can hit some questions off real quick because I can read a lot faster than, than I can talk in your market. Okay, yeah, I mean, it just, you gotta think of the ROI. It just depends on the rental property and the type of tenant. So some tenants don't mind using laundromats. Some tenants really prefer to have in-suite laundry. And so in some units, it makes a $100 a month difference. And if it costs you $1,000 to put it in, that's a fantastic return on investment, right? Get your money back in 10 months. So that's a great investment. I would definitely, if you can justify that, you can look at different listings. You can talk to tenants. Often I'll show a unit and I'll say like, Hey, you know, would you be willing to pay $50 more a month if I put in a dishwasher and laundry? And they'd be like, yes, like I'll pay 75 more a month. It's like, okay, when you move in at the end of the month, it will be done. And so it's as easy as that. You can just ask the tenants what they prefer. But if you, you know, and then once you get to know the market, you just do that ahead of time and you advertise that in your listing and you get a better quality tenant. Often like, you know, it's really important that you, you, you focus on, um, just, just doing your numbers. At the end of the day, you gotta do your numbers. Everything you do, make sure that you're, you're appealing to the right clientele because you're running a business. Your tenant is your customer. And so what do they wanna see and what is the caliber of, ten, of tenant or type of customer that you want in your property? If you want that C-level tenant that loves the laundromat and is cool with like no laundry and no dishwasher, okay. But like, even if I got no more rent and I had an A-level tenant that's working at like IBM and is a, a software developer, um, I, I really think that it would be sweet to see, you know, that higher quality tenant. I've seen something messages come up about being a dictator or something. Like, I appreciate the vote if I if I ever were going on politics. I just right now don't have a desire for that. You got some love going on there in the bottom. Um, <laughs> I, I love that. But uh, <laughs> thanks guys for the for the active you know, you know, commentary. Seems to really want to meet you, so you know. Hey, right on. Make it happen. Um, see thanks, Nino. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, we should meet up. I mean, you should come to London, Ontario, and we should meet. How do you get approved for a loan at 18, no credit, just doing it as a realtor? I mean, at the end of the day, it comes down to, I've been thinking about getting my own realtor license here in Ontario. I've just thought about getting it and, and having it just to have access to that. I know it's like three grand a year to maintain a license here in, in Ontario, but uh, you know, build your credit up, get a credit card when you turn 18. That's the first thing you can do and use that credit card and pay it off every single month. Just start establishing credit because age of credit is important, um, showing that, the lender wants to see that you've had credit open, you've been using that credit effectively. So the more credit products you have open, and the better you use those products, the better chance they have to lend you a m more money, like a mortgage or an unsecured line of credit. I now, like my credit score is fairly good and they've seen that I've borrowed millions and paid it all back and I'm always up to date on my mortgages. So like I get calls like, hey, we wanna increase your credit card limit to 28,000, we've pre-approved you, or 30, 35,000, we've pre-approved you. And like, I would never be able to get even approved for those things now, but now they call me and they ask me, right? So that's sort of, as you build that up, you build that history over time, um, the banks want you to have their money, right? They want to put it in the least risky places and get the best return they possibly can on, on that money. Little they know that I always pay my credit cards off so they get nothing from me. I just get 2% two, <laughs> two cash back points. So That actually fed into a second question because the second question was how to build credit at 17. Right on. That yeah, that's exactly how you do it. You just and answered you're... two and one, so look at you go. There we go. Have you ever drank laundry detergent? Lava cake, man. You are so troll. This um, guy, yeah. No, do not eat those pods. That's That's... What? How's that even? What I see those memes. Would that be for your daughter? No, that would not I mean, be a good example for my daughter. It wouldn't be an example, good example for you guys. I'm about helping you build financial literacy and no. Um, you were in my dream last night. I'm not even kidding. Nino, man, that's that's creepy, but also cool. Um, I'm actually having an impact on people's lives and that gives me so much motivation to keep doing this because if I'm having an impact on your life, that means I've done my job. That's, that's why I'm doing this, guys. Is, if I can help anyone be slightly more financially literate in, in any way, right? Like if you're like, your credit score is a little bit better or like you save like 10 bucks more next month or you know, you bought that rental property because you wouldn't have otherwise. Hey, you know what? That's awesome. It is totally worth it. At the end of the day for me, if you guys are, you know, taking action, getting shit done, you know, doing better deals than you would have done otherwise. Um, okay, let's go down to lava cake. 
Michael Chung, yo, Mike, how have you been? I have been busy. I take on way too much. People message me and I just, I am a yes man. I like to bite off a lot more than I can chew. Like everyone's like, hey Mike, let's buy this business. Hey Mike, start a property management company. Hey Mike, help me buy three rental properties here. I want you to manage them. Let's do joint venture partnership, 50-50, you're active. And it's like, I just say yes. Like I, my whole life I've always just said yes. And I put myself out there to the world and it sometimes bites me in the butt, but it also, you know, the type of personality that I am, I just, drowned and drink from the fire hose and so that's been sort of something that uh, has been cool jared thanks for stopping in man um glad you jumped on the the channel there um have a good one <laughs> chris that's true you're still here <laughs> we're trolls but we love your stream no fair point fair point anything you guys seriously want to know like is there any question that you have about you know maybe you're like 14 years old and you want to know about you know how, how do you get your first job what career do you go into how do you, what is entrepreneurship about? What's it like not having a job? You know, what, what's, what's that like? What's it like a day in your shoes? Uh, I forgot about Why Is Wealth Wednesday is gonna have to rewatch the recording. Yeah, so I'll throw this up. It's gonna be a short one today, just an hour, guys. Um, we're at 50 minutes, so you got about nine minutes left, and then I'm gonna jump off. Um, that's creepy. My own name. My own wife is watching <laughs> on my own name. That is creepy. I'm watching myself. Um, thanks for supporting, appreciate that. Uh, your take on McDonald's. McDonald's isn't good for your for your gut, so don't eat a lot of it. Um, but no, seriously, um, you know, I, I think that in times of recession, fast food tends to do fairly well. So, I mean, McDonald's has a really iconic brand, and uh, I think it's going to be here for a long time. Uh, you know what, you know, Michael, you got a point. You're saying you know McDonald's is wallet friendly. You know what, I actually don't find McDonald's that wallet friendly. I go there, get a burger, fries, and a drink, and it's like seven, eight. Seven eight dollars. Like, I, I can literally go down to like the, the Vietnamese restaurant and get like a huge bowl of like f beef pho for like six bucks and split it with someone. I eat for like way more, like a pound of food yep. to like a quarter pounder. Um, so yeah, McDonald's is actually not well priced, but people perceive it as well priced. It is fast and easy, and so if you need something fast, then McDonald's makes sense. I have some friends who are like huge. Um, I think of one person specifically. It's a huge advocate, and he, and he just loves McDonald's. So. Um, Hit those coupons. The nice thing about McDonald's is there's always coupons. I'm always in line, I'm Googling, I'm finding coupons. Like everything, buy one, get one free. Buy this, one can dine for $6 and $5.99. Um, so yeah, check that out, guys. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah. Thanks for your feedback on investing. All right, all right. thanks, Lindsay, appreciate that. Um, Mr. Beefy, awesome. Thanks for the live video, tons of great value. What time do you typically start your live stream? So I try to aim for seven, but I always have technical issues getting my phone on this tripod here and getting everything set up. So around seven, I try to do it 7 p.m. Eastern, um, 4 p.m. Pacific. So try to tune in for that. I'm gonna try to make this a recurring thing that I do. Um, I actually have someone here with me, which I'll introduce maybe in a future video, uh, Kyle, who's gonna help me with some intros and stuff to make my, my quality of my videos better for you guys. And I'm gonna invest in a lab mic so you can hear me better. Uh, I'm just gonna make some small investments so that you guys can get a lot more value from the content that I'm producing. Yeah, Elise has got a great point. That's Every time you see me in the comments, that's actually my wife right now watching out in the living room. Um, yeah, it, health problems long-term, exactly. There are some healthy alternatives at McDonald's, but it's gonna you're gonna lose more in the savings and in, in the cost of your healthcare. Not to mention, it's cheaper to go to the grocery store. You go it to is way cheaper. Or like whatever American equivalents and cook your own meals. Exactly, it's cheaper. exactly. Um, thanks, Jonas, for, I, I appreciate that so much. Um, wow, 63 to 150% increase in income because of you. Like Jonas, if, if that's what you did to me, like, holy crap, man, like, that's awesome. That makes me feel so good that, that you're making, and, and you know what I'm hoping? If you've increased your income 100%, you better be increasing your savings rate by 100% as well. So don't be spending all the earning, start saving and investing. I'll be there to like whip you guys, because you know I know how hard it can be in society. I'm like your guy that's here, you can like say, this week I had a really hard time. Like my friends were like making fun of me because I didn't go out and like, oh, you know, I'm always this frugal guy. I'm here. Like I went through that. I've been through that and, and I've saved my way um, through that. So I'm uh, one of those guys too. So. Yeah, there, there are lots of us out there. We're just, we are the minority, unfortunately. And so it, it isn't culturally, socially acceptable to be frugal. I think, um, I think it's just because people don't know about it. Yeah. If people knew that it was this People like to speak. spend too, I think. I don't know why. Just if people feel good spending and so they like just don't want to change. and don't want legacy of consumerism, man. 
I mean, people are spending billions, like companies are spending billions to ensure that we spend our money. And so that's really, really important to kind of keep in your mind and try to fight against because they're doing everything they can to help you spend. So a lot of what you can do is just don't impulse buy, do the, do the whole think about it, wait a day or two and then reevaluate it. Is there a better way that I can do this? Is there a way that I can find this um, good or find this service that I need in a different way, in a more cost effective way? Often you'll just spend a day thinking about it and you'll find a better way to get the exact same thing. Um, Nino, I like that. Um, he's having a family so young, worth it. You know, I had kids young, so I'm biased. Um, my daughter was born when I was, what, 23? So I, I did have kids young. Um, but I think that the advantages, so the disadvantages are that when you're young, you, if you have kids, it slows you down. Like I can't work near as hard because I have to spend time with my daughter. And that's not necessarily a negative thing. It's a positive thing for life balance. And you know, at the end of the day, it, it does really, is really fulfilling and feels really, really good. So um, you just gotta make sure that you make a choice that's, that's educated and is a good fit for you. Every person's different, every person has a different situation. I like the fact that my daughter is gonna be, you know, going off to university at 18 years old when I'm like 41, 42. So I'm gonna be free to, to travel and enjoy life when she's in, in school there. And most people are gonna be 50 when I'm, you know, 42. So I'm just getting it done earlier and I do recommend this though. I spent a lot of time, we delayed having, having kids uh, even a couple years because you know, we got married, we got married really young. My wife and I have been together since I was 16. So we've been together like a long time, 10 years now in November. And so for us, it was about, you know, I was very much like, let's make sure our financial base is secure. Like make sure you got that financial base. Um, it's yeah, really, really hard. Yeah. And that she's bored with, with everything. Exactly. Cause you know, it's, it's really like kids are going to test your relationship. Your, your kids are going to push you further and harder than you ever thought. Um, and push you to the max. Like when you're stressed out with something, it, it's like having a second layer of complexity and just like double the weight on your shoulders, which like, it's totally worth it. Like don't talk about just the negatives, but making sure you do have that financial base. And, and, and for me, it was like making sure I was close to financial freedom, not fully financially independent, but close to financial freedom. And so when my wife and I got pregnant, it was like, I gotta make sure I like start getting rental properties. So you can see my, my growth like accelerates and I work twice as hard to make sure that I had that time to be with my daughter. I didn't wanna be working all the time and never be home. And I just didn't want, didn't want that. It's hard to be a good parent working like eight to eight. Like a lot of bankers work 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. If your kid goes to sleep at 8.30, you literally, and your kid gets up at eight in the morning, you literally don't see your, your child. Like how can you be a good parent if you're not there for them? Someone else is raising your kid. So. It's really hard to do that, right? So statistically, it's not. Possible. Yeah, so I, I just I'm not a big fan of. I really am just not a big fan of of you know working eight to eight when you're got a young family at home. Spend some time with your family. It's really really important at the end of the day to make sure that you uh, you keep, keep some time for your family, keep some time for your friends too, for yourself. I spent hundred hour weeks for like seven years straight, and it took a toll on my health, took a toll on some of my relationships. And I did that like up until my daughter was born. And even then I was still pushing until she was like a year old where like I was just grinding all the time. And like I made sure my one thing was like I got always home for bath time, bedtime. So I put her to bed, do the bath routine, do the story times. So there was something where we had that relationship. And that's really been important to me at the end of the day. At the end of the day, why are we doing this? Like why are we focused on financial literacy and building wealth and financial freedom and et cetera? It's so that you can actually um, be there with your family and enjoy your life. So that's the end goal at the end of the day there's nothing more important than, than, you know, you can't forget about the pieces of your life that actually are meaningful in the pursuit of wealth and the pursuit of, of all of these things. So just keep that in mind, guys. Um, whatever you're doing, don't, don't burn yourself out. Uh, I see a bunch of comments. Got to try to catch up on. There's a bunch. Hey, do I persuade someone who lives paycheck to paycheck, but has the ability to save? Yes. I, I think, I think it's, you, you should persuade them to, to live better, but it's up to them at the end of the day. It's their choice. And uh, what's the line from the Bible? Um, Thou shalt not cast pearls before swine. So, yeah. So the idea is that pick if, a sliver if, out of your own eye before you uh, exactly. if someone take it out is, of someone else's. If someone wants to be lost, then you won't persuade them. And it's, it's Although like maybe they've never found it before. So giving them a chance to yeah, see the information by, by might be worthwhile. Yeah. Elliot, welcome. Thanks for joining in. Hey Mike, what are your thoughts on being an out of town landlord? Would you recommend it for a first time investment property? Um, I like to touch and feel all of my real estate, all the things that I'm investing in. I like to be able to just be like 10 or 20 minutes away. So I'm not a big fan of owning real estate far away unless you have trusted people in that city. So if you have family in that city or you have someone you can really rely on to take care of that property in an emergency, um, and let, like you just have to have someone on point. If you have a really good manager, you're okay. Um, but just, yeah, making sure that you have someone 
they're looking out for your property the way you would want to look out for your property. And I just didn't know anyone outside of my network. So I've never invested in like the United States or far away because I just, I've always wanted to be close to my properties to manage them myself. And no one's going to manage your properties better than you or better than an active partner. So my suggestion is if you're going to go out of town, partner with someone um, because if they have an active stake in the interest and value of your property, they're on, they're aligned with your interests. Whereas maybe a, someone who's just a manager or an employee or something, they might leave and then you're screwed, right? Or they don't care because they don't have any ownership or stake in the, at the end of the day. So and speaking from the rental perspective, I've had an out of town landlord, not worth it. It's yeah, it's yeah. tough, right? To it's manage that. And if they don't have any connections yeah. to handle things yeah, like no fault to the guy, but it's like, you know, problems don't get fixed. Yeah, yeah. Because he had a family too, so it's like what's right. more important to him. Exactly. So you got to think of it that way from the tenant's perspective as well. Uh, thanks, Angel. <laughs> Guys, financial Jesus reincarnation. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, how much did you spend on your wedding? Do you mind me asking? Yeah, I'm like, I'll tell you. Um, I think we spent about eight thousand dollars on our wedding. Um, we had half of it contributed by her parents as a gift from the wedding. The other half we had to we saved up. And I think we, with with gifts from the wedding, after we had all the gifts from people who came, we ended up breaking even. So we ended up doing okay. People kind of donated equivalent to the cost of their plate. So it worked out okay um, in the gift section of the wedding. We kind of broke even. So just don't go too crazy. You can have a really great wedding if you just shop around. We um, did it at an amazing castle here in London, uh, the Delta Armories, and it was a really sweet venue. Um, worked out really, really well. Uh, I made my friend drink hot dog water. Am I a bad person? <laughs> I don't know. Kids do crazy things. Adults do crazy things too. Um, you can always change and be, be a better person. Uh, we all do dumb shit sometimes. Um, Paul, hey! Mike's one of the smartest young men I know, very intelligent. Thanks, Paul, for jumping on. Um, I'll talk to you later about uh, the investment property deal. Nino, do you have any vices? Um, yeah, you know, I have my vices just like anyone else. Um, I used to be a really big gamer, so I would be trapped in the games like World of Warcraft and things like that, where it became my life. It was everything to me, and I had to quit that game and turn real estate into my game um, for me in order to get ahead financially or I would just sat on my computer all day long because I, I just get sucked into video games in the real the world of that so that's a, been a big vice for me um, I like myself some haagen dazs ice cream um, it's not good for me I know but it's a huge vice for me um, yeah I am wrapping up right soon my wife has to go to yoga and I gotta put my daughter down to bed family time is really important guys so I'm gonna wrap this up I might jump back on um, later We'll see. How do you survive without income? I'm going to be a realtor full time. Yeah, so when you're working any entrepreneurial job or any kind of job where you're relying on commissions or that sort of thing, it can be very difficult to sustain yourself through that, those periods. I would say build up a reserve fund, an emergency fund to cover yourself. And then when you get that commission check, just make sure you, you are very frugal and, and make sure you kind of balance that out and keep that going. Um, you know, st Stabilize that income. Don't just blow that whole commission check and be broke. The next three months or else you're gonna make decisions and you're not gonna advise your clients in the best manner because you're hungry for that commission I don't like any salesperson or agent that needs the money to live I feel like they'd be more desperate to do things that aren't necessarily um, in their in your best interest as a client so try not to do that as an agent a lot of agents are really just focused on getting the sale done um, thanks for respond thanks appreciate that um, great questions awesome oh I see you just jump in there yeah um, do, do, do. Awesome. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to wrap this up, guys, because my wife has to go. I might jump back on later for Wise Wealth Wednesdays in like an hour. Um, we'll see. Uh, fried butter, yes or no? You know, I like fried butter. Uh, but no, I, I don't, I'm not a big drinker, not a big smoker. I don't have a lot of vices that way, but I do have vices. See you guys later. Thank you for jumping on. It's been like 17, 18 people in here. That's been awesome. Thank you guys so, so much for jumping on for Wise Wealth Wednesdays. I'm hoping to build a consistent following of you guys every single Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern. 4 p.m. Pacific, tune in. I will be live around that time. If I don't jump on right at seven, give me 10 or 15 minutes because sometimes life happens and I don't always get the chance um, to, you know, make it on. Um, nice. Wow. It's 3.14 here. So good night. Um, must be from the other, si other side of the world there in Europe or something. See you guys. I might be on a bit later, but if I'm not, I'll see you guys next Wednesday. Cheers. Thanks so much, guys.